My name is Sawika Colbert. I'm a Vice Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences at Georgetown University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you again to our speaker series, Such a Time as This. This series emerged in response to the racial violence, specifically anti-Black racism, that unfolded this summer and continues to unfold by drawing attention to our faculty's much longer consideration of racial justice and the university's role in advancing it. We will explore how the work of the university may be mobilized for such a time as this. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's session, which will explore intersectionality, women acting up. I'm also pleased to share that this is a Jesuit University crossover event in that we have a faculty member from Boston College joining us. So please let me introduce all the speakers now. Maria Loza is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of History and the Department of American Studies at Georgetown University. Her areas of research include Latinx history, social movements, labor history, and food studies. Her book, Defiant Braceros, How Migrant Workers Fought for Racial, Sexual, and Political Freedom, examines the Bracero program and how guest workers negotiated the interest Intricacies of, uh, intricacies of indigeneity, intimacy, and transnational organizing. She is currently carrying out research for her second book project tentatively titled, The Strangeness and Bitterness of Plenty, Making Food and Seeing Race in the Agricultural West. Our second speaker, Regine Michelle jean is an associate professor of Romance Languages and Literatures and African and African Diaspora Studies at Boston College. jean Shell is a Black feminist literary scholar and cultural critic spe specializing in Francophonie studies. Her scholarship and teaching on world literatures in French includes work on Black France, Sub-Saharan Africa, Haiti, and the Haitian diaspora. Her first book, Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation in the Francophonie Imaginary, examines th theoretical, visual, and literary texts that challenge the dominant views of sexual violence. jean Charles is currently working on a second book that examines representations of girlhood in Haitian literature and culture. Dr. Jamil Scott is an assistant professor of government at Georgetown University. She received her doctorate from Michigan State University in political science and her bachelor's degree from University of Mar Maryland College Park. She is the past recipient of the King Chavez Park Future Faculty Fellowship, as well as a co-PI on a grant from the New America Foundation. She has published in politics, groups, and identities, and American politics research. She is currently working on a book-length study in which she seeks to understand Black women's political emergence in state-level politics. Finally, our moderator for today's discussion, Denise Brennan, is a professor of the Department of Anthropology at Georgetown University, where she is also the faculty co-founder and co-director of the Gender Justice, the Gender Plus and Justice Initiative, our co-sponsor for today's session. Her scholarship focuses on migration, labor, trafficking, sex work, and policing. Professor Brennan is the author of What's Love Got to Do With It? Transnational Desires and Sex Tourism in the Dominican Republic. Her next book follows the lives of the first survivors of trafficking in the United States, entitled Life Interrupted, Trafficking into Forced Labor in the United States. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn things over to Professor Brennan. Thank you, Professor Colbert. I want to um, thank uh, Dean Chalenza and particularly Soyika for um, launching this series and making intersectional feminism an important pillar. Um, we have a wonderful roundup today of, of um, intersectional feminist thinkers. So I'm gonna um, start the conversation and ask a broad question. If you could each tell us about your research and how it advances racial justice. Regime, would you like to go first, please? Yes, I get, I'm a guest, so I get to go first. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I want to just thank all of you for having us here. Thank you, Soika, for that introduction and for 
um, the invitation. And thank you so much, Denise, to you for um, facilitating this conversation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, as Soika said, as a, from a Jesuit um, sibling university as well. So when I think about you know, racial justice, it has to be approached through an intersectional lens, right? And so we all know that when we're talking about intersectionality, we're talking about the ways in which the different forms of oppression exacerbate one another. Um, and I take this lens in my research um, to everything that I do, right? It informs everything that I do. So the first book that I wrote, which is about um, sexual violence, I was really concerned about rape culture and how rape culture and was really percolating around the globe. But what concerned me was also how um, the way that we talked about violence, specifically in a post-colonial context, uh, was often, it often uh, even, erased the fact of sexual violence, right? So a lot of times what we would see is the symbolism, um, like we would hear the rape of the African continent, but we never thought about the lived experience of people that had actually experienced sexual violence. And so part of what I do and why I think this is, you know, really advancing racial justice, because I, I always approach it as who's getting left out, right? Who are we thinking? Who, who, who is marginalized? Who are the most marginalized in our thinking? And so when I look at my work, I always approach it from that vantage point. So I thought, you know, what happens when we put Black women survivors at the center of how we talk about sexual violence? What happens when we focus on their experiences, when we privilege their subjugated knowledge? How does that change our view of rape culture? And to me, that's really what the work of of racial justice requires is that we think about, you know, when we say Black Lives Matter, are we saying all Black Lives Matter or are we saying some Black Lives Matter more than others? Part of, for me, this there's a, there's a crime of omission, omission that has just taken place over and over again that I'm constantly trying to, to press into and to amplify in all of my work. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, Jamil, do you want to um, jump in, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, so um, I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, and uh, thank you um, for having me um, to be on this panel. Um, I, I would say that um, one of the central things that I'm concerned in with my work and how I try to put forth the notion of racial justice is to think about um, when, we're, when we're talking about politics, um, which women are we talking about, right? When, when we're having these conversation about women running for office or women engaging in politics, which women, right? Um, oftentimes there's this dichotomy of women or people of color are doing something, right? Which women are we talking about? And um, are we excluding women of color when we say the term or when we talk in these, this language of uh, women and people of color. Where do women of color fit in this conversation and how are we honoring their political participation and their ideological and political um, uh, contributions here? Um, it's funny because I was just, um, as, I'm, as I'm working on my book project, I was just reading Patricia Hill Collins' work and, and one of the modes in which she talks about um, Black women's political oppression in the United States states is politically right in terms of um how black women are left out of the conversation or left out of uh political mechanisms to engage right so part of my work is thinking about how do we explain black women's participation right how do we tell their story about why they engage in politics and and not just uh relegate it to all women do this no all women don't right um i firmly believe that women of color have uh, their own story um, about why they decide to be engaged in politics. And, and some of that has to do with the violence that they've been subject to in the United States as, as a space, right? Um, from, from slavery onward, right? Um, and the 2018 uh, election cycle is just one example in which we can think about how black women's political participation looks different, right? As we saw, mothers like Lucy Beth run, right, on the subject of gun violence against her son, right, um, running to change the narrative, running not just because she had some sense of political ambition or, or desire to, to uh, be engaged in politics, um, that wasn't her notion, but we often think about politics as something or political ambition as something that people are actively engaged in since college, right? That people go in thinking they wanna be politicians. No, she came in 
to solve a problem, right? And so um, for me, my work is doing justice to Black women's narratives and why they engage in politics. Wonderful, thank you, Professor Scott. And our newest faculty member, Professor Loza, thank you. It's such a great joy to join such fantastic women on this panel. Um, my work really looks at and problematizes narratives about the past and really complicates this notion of why Latinx immigrants come to the US. I've often been frustrated, even from the time I was like 18, 19, with this narrative that it's simply poverty and geographic proximity, that those two are the reasons why people end up coming to the US as both documented and undocumented workers. And what I really try to do is look at power. How do states, how does the nation state uh, basically um, develop mechanisms and really exploit this uneven relationship of power with other countries? And so for most of my, um, for most of my time in graduate school and as soon as I got out of um, my graduate program, I focused on the figure of the guest worker. And I figured I uh, focused on the largest guest worker program in American history, the Bracero program, to really think about why this new figure emerged. We have citizens, we have residents, we have undocumented people, but why do we create a category and a relationship with the nation state of a perpetually disposable, expendable worker? And why are we okay with that? And so I look at basically how this worker became the backbone of basically farm work, our food system, and agriculture. And more than that, I look at how guest workers basically are intimately tied with undocumented workers, and it's easy to move in and out of these categories. And so my new um, research really explores why, why and how we got to this situation in American fields. And more so, I think I'm really troubled with people's ambivalence that our hardest working people in agriculture don't have paths to full citizenship and to full entry into the American economy. Either as undocumented workers or as guest workers, they're designed to be perpetual outsiders. And so that's kind of what I look at. And for me, it's really important to think about gender to, in order to really explore how we think about family, how we valorize basically single men as this, you know, an important part of this workforce when women are there as well. And women have a particularly um, troubling relationship in the fields because they're often not only subject to labor exploitation, but sexual exploitation and harassment. And so that's a lot of what my work really problematizes and thinks about. And more than anything, you know, it really problematizes this idea that, you know, much of the food that we eat, vegetables, produce is touched by people who will be by design perpetual outsiders. Mm. Great. Thank you, Professor Losa. Um, to all the attendees out there, you can send in some questions, please, for this dynamic panel. Um, you can use the Q&A function and I will um, pose some of those questions. So now let's move on to another question here. So the theme of the panel is women acting up, which I love. Um, and thinking through Angela Davis's idea that if you're going to radically transform the world, you have to do it all the time. So how do you see your work addressing the constellation of crises that are, are going on right now? I guess we can just continue in the same order, Professor Jean-Charles. Sure. Um, first, I do have to say that I, I, I love the title, both of the series, um, Such a Time as This, which comes from, you know, the book of Esther, um, and as well as the title that we have for our, our, our session today, which is um, Intersectionality and Women Acting Up. And I was thinking about um, why I love that book, the book of Esther, so much is because, you know, Esther was a woman who really did act up, right? She, um, she, well, I'm not going to like 
debrief the whole thing. But, but basically, you know, Esther is also known for having said, if I perish, I perish, right? So basically she had to confront patriarchy. She had to confront the king when she was not. And you, as a woman exploited in that time, you were only allowed to have an audience with the king or ask a question if you were called for, right? And so she was, she was you know, also trafficked and sexually exploited and all of these things. Um, but I, 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 that line that resonates with me is this idea of if I perish, I perish, right? And so Esther makes a choice to act up in a way that costs her something. And I think that that's important for us today as we think about this question um, of doing the work all of the time, right? How, to what extent are we taking the idea of if I perish, I perish with us into our classrooms, into our activist work, into our families? You know, I have, I have four children and I often say that like the work um, that, that I do, I have to, like my children force me to be constantly present as a feminist. <laughs> Um, because, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I, I don't, I have to think about the ways that I'm tacitly maybe have succumbed to patriarchy, even in my own parenting, right? And the way that I talk, so all of the time, right? So I don't, I don't get a break necessarily, right? So when I'm, I'm in, in the classroom and I'm lecturing or when I'm on campus or when I'm doing my activist work, um, I'm constantly being attentive to, okay, well, how am I using language and how am I, you know, how am I uh, maybe um, exploiting my own power, right? How am I thinking about power relations here? And then in the household, this is also something that I have to advance. And so I think that, you know, to your question, um, to constantly be doing the work, uh, one of the ways that I've tried to do that is really by leading an integrated life, right? So by showing up um, as the same person in the classroom who is going to be teaching my students about rape culture, teaching my students to take take an intersectional approach to thinking about um sexual violence that has students think about the intersection of gender justice and racial justice. Um, and also to do that, you know, when I'm doing local organizing in our towns, we've been doing, you know, I live in a suburb of Massachusetts and since June, we've been doing a lot of um, organizing around anti-racism and promoting anti-racism in the school district. Uh, or the work that I do, you know, with a long walk home whose mission is to um, end violence uh, against women and girls using the arts. And, and also, you know, in my personal relationships, right? So whether it's with my family members or my friends or the students that I'm mentoring, how do I constantly um, press into these questions and try to advance or create more justice, right? The idea is, how, you know, I love what you said, Mireya, about the food, because it's like, how do the choices that we make about what we eat, is that advancing justice, right? How do the choices that we make about, you know, what we drive or where we go to school, or all those things, how is that advancing justice? And um, um, that also makes me think about uh, something that Tony K. Bambara, who I just adore, um, said. And this is the other thing for me is that I often like turn to the words of black feminist thinkers, right? Um, in order to animate my thinking and in order to animate my engagement with the world. And she says, um, you know, revolution begins with the self in the self, right? We better take the time to fashion revolutionary selves, revolutionary lives and revolutionary relationships. And I think that that quote by Tony K. Mbabara really gets to the core of what Angela Davis is talking about, right? Because in order to do that revolution outside of you, you have to fashion in that within yourself as well. Wonderful, thank you. Professor Scott. Um, so I think this election cycle um, has really called me to think about not just, um, uh, not just how I practice um, this commitment in my own life or my commitment to justice in my own life, but um, engaging others, right? Because this, uh, I would say that we, we are in a space right now where, you know, it's, it's not just a question of, um, th there, there are real things at stake. I'll say it like that. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think I've, I've been a lot more active in, in being out and, you know, talking and engaging with, um, newspapers, et cetera. Right. Because I want folks to see, right. That this is really the, there are real things at stake this election cycle, and they, they there should be a consideration of what this means. And I think in, in, in 2016, there were questions around um, whether or not um, folks should be engaged, right? And, and I'm not here to, you know, um, I'm not here to say whether or not people should um, be faithful or believe in the system as it stands, right? Because that can be difficult, particularly when we think about how um, race and gender in the United States interact to um, create 
harm um, to, to people. So I think this question really, um, really involves considering uh, how America is, a, is as a space right now, right? And it, we're in a hard place, right? And so it involves doing not um, a lot more than I, I usually would, right? More than I would usually think about, more, being more active and being more out there than I would be because the stakes are just that much higher, right? When we think about um, these narratives, for instance, around, you know, the election cycle or even early voting right now that people are saying, folks are out here waiting in lines because it, people are excited, right? I would love to think that we live in a space where people are excited about being uh, engaging in participation, right? I, I, I study participation, right? But that's just not the real story. Um, the fact that folks are waiting in line is an indicative of a more sinister aspect of our system, right? That um, folks are waiting in line to vote, to, to practice, um, you know, a right that, that they've been given, right? And so um, for me, practicing um, and, and thinking about justice is uh, more than just, in this moment, it's more than just talking to my friends and making sure that they're active and engaged. It's, it's putting myself out there in ways that, that um, I think ha has in the past created um, issues for me, right? That like, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure, um, as women and, and women of color on this panel, they've had these uh, experiences where they've written some or they've talked about the work that they're doing and someone has responded negatively or or talked negatively back to them, right? Um, the emails, uh, the negative emails aren't great, but I think at this time more than any other time, um, it's important to do the work, right? To be out there and risk the negative emails because, or the negative feedback because um, the stakes are just that high. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that was wonderful. And most certainly the moment demands that level of thought thoughtfulness. Thank you, Professor Scott. Professor Losa. I think as for me, I've never felt such a higher calling to actually engage my students and give them tools to answer the questions that they have right now. I, you know, I feel that it's very even palpable through our Zoom classes that they need not only analytical tools, they need to understand how we organized in the past so that they can think about the present and answer these really pressing um, issues that, I mean, they've come to sharp relief in the past year. Through COVID, I think it's exacerbated a lot of things that, you know, that they have questions about. And, you know, as a historian, there's never been a more important time, you know, when history and our historical narratives are about the past are being called to serve a patriotic, you know, nation. I think, well, this is when historians roll up their sleeves and say, let's think about what and how people did you know for example this this week you know i you know taught about basically leftist movements in los angeles and one of my students from la said i'd never read about the watts uprisings and for him it was just this moment where this clicked and i keep thinking to myself i just need more of those clickable moments so that my students can see all of these problems, people had these questions. They had these questions 50 years ago. They had these questions 60 years ago. These are sometimes not new problems. The configurations may be new, but communities of color have, have faced this. And so, you know, this is, this is just, you know, the moment where both my recent research, my teaching, you know, what I do outside of the classroom has come together. And, you know, I just think, <sighs> Despite all of the challenges, my hope is that what we do in the classrooms really um, makes change. Thank you, Professor Losa. On this note, I, I, I really wonder if this level of rupture right now is so great um, that you might consider through an intersectional lens, 
going into the classroom in a different way from here on in. You know, if you, if you will, like things, the genie can't be put back in the bottle, right? Um, so I'm wondering how you um, see this moment of rupture through this intersectional lens, but with a particular focus on your activism and perhaps teaching as a, a part of that. Um, Professor Jean-Charles? I mean, I guess I would piggyback off of what Mireya is saying, because I feel like even like calling it a moment of rupture, I feel, you know, Mireya, what I was hearing and what you're saying is like, we've been here, <laughs> right? Like I've been teaching this way <laughs> for a very long time. I learned it this way. I was trained by other black feminists, you know, that this work of racial justice, we've been doing some organizing at Boston College as well. And, you know, we have this new forum on racial justice. And I said to, um, I, I was telling the Dean of the law school who, who was the head of it yesterday. I said, you know, in, in our, in African and African diaspora studies, the scholars that we have on campus who are doing Black studies, we've been doing this for a very long time, right? And so there's a part of me that also has to think about um, that those clickable moments, right? And the need to bring other people along. Um, and so you feel kind of vindicated, to be honest with you, with like, yes, you know, everyone's saying intersectionality now, thank you. Um, you're starting to get it, right? Um, I think that there are a lot of people for whom uh, this, what, what is, it's not really rupture, but it's a, a continuation, right, of work that has been being done. And if you think about the long project, you know, Black Studies is a long project, right, or as I always tell my students, we say, say her name now, but, you know, Ida B. Wells was saying, say her name, right, Sojourner Truth was saying, say her name. And so there are all these ways in which Black Lives Matter is helping to give us language in this moment, but we have to understand that it is also, it has a long trajectory and a long history. And so I'm excited by the opportunity opportunity to, to, to illuminate those places for people, right? So if, if that, maybe that's the point of rupture, but we say, okay, you know, you've heard about Black Lives Matter, but let me tell you about the Haitian Revolution, right? And how these people who were enslaved threw off the yoke of slavery because they believed, they dared to believe in their own humanity and their own dignity. That was an act of Black Lives Matter, right? Let me tell you, um, I have students, uh, to, last summer I took a group of students to Paris and um, we, we learned about, the class was called Paris Noir, and um, we had activists, we had Black Lives Matter activists from Paris that came to our class and we had students that said, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, this was also a thing here. And I'm like, oh yes, anti-Blackness is a global project, right? And let's look at how over the history people have been writing about this and representing it. Um, so for me, I guess vindication might be the thing that I feel, you know, just to say that this, we've been doing this work, you know, we've been here doing this work for a long time. And it's, it's, it's nice um, in the sense that, you know, I, I again, don't get me wrong, like I wish that it didn't have to take for Breonna Taylor um, to be killed in the way that she was and then for her not to have justice for people to, to say, wow, look how black women, look how differently black women are treated this year, right, for the first time. I mean, this, when Say Her Name started in 2014, as many people didn't know about it as they know about it now, right? Um, so don't get me wrong, I don't wish that these things had happened, but I, I, I do think that in a way it's really amplifying the, the Black Studies project um, that has existed for a very long time, for centuries. Um, to those points, I think that um, uh, I think it's really important in, the, in this time point that um, we continue that work of naming um, how how some of the some of these things that we we see right now are new, right? Like Regine was saying here that, um, and also that um, I think that we have this tendency to make history feel uh, very clean and nice and wrapped in a box. And often a lot of these things are very messy, right? And th that, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, particularly when we think about civil rights movement in the United States, there's a nice narrative around the civil rights movement that students learn. And I think it, it's, it's our, it is our duty to disavow them of those notions that everything is not so neat and clean and nice, right? And and protests gets messy, right? And um, and it's and, and because social movements require things to get messy when you're trying to you know advocate for change. And I and I think um, some of the conversations right now are you know asking why doesn't Black Lives Matter, for example, look like the civil rights movement? Well, um, we're in a different. We, it, I, I think I would, not even that we're in a different time. I think the better question is, um, 
does it, is it all that different, right? <laughs> is it all, I mean, certainly there are differences and intentional differences, but you know, in, in the ways in which social movements, you know, push for change, is there difference in how, you know, folks are advocating and pushing and, you know, the diff what's the difference between folks being out on the streets now than there was in the, in the 50s and 60s, right? Right down the street in Baltimore, uh, my grandmother, um, when she first moved to Baltimore, had to put, um, I think it was candles in her windows. Uh, mm -hmm. Black neighborhoods were putting candles in their windows so that, um, you know, their house, houses wouldn't get, you know, uh, uh, destroyed when, when uh, after Martin Luther King died, right? How is that different than what's happening now? Um, I, I think um, the best thing that we can do for students is disavow them of the notion that um, politics is neat and clean and that history um, and, and how things were done um, was neat and clean because it's, it's often not at all, right? Um, and I think it's also really important that um, we, we make it clear to students that this is a global movement, thinking right now about what's happening in Nigeria, right? And how there's a push to end police brutality there, right? Um, and, and the movements that are happening in other countries are organizing around, you know, their, their, their Black lives, right? I, I think, you know, I think it's important that students understand in this time of social media, in this time of, um, you know, uh, of uh, engagement across spaces that things aren't new, but also um, these issues aren't just here in the United States. I'd echo what Professor Jean Charles said and Professor Scott. Um, I think part of it is also just having them grapple with the messiness, the contradictions. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for the most part, I teach a lot of courses that focus on the Latinx experience. And I think often my students really want heroes because they haven't seen them, right? And so they want these very perfect, precise people that always do the right thing. And the really interesting thing is to show them the conflicts, the changes, and to see basically folks that were in leadership positions change within five, 10 years. That 1965 was very different than 1970. Even though in your mind, it, you know, as, as a student, if it's the first time you hear, you might collapse the two, you know? And so, I don't know, I think for me, it really is just, making sure that, you know, they see people in the past is really conflicted and, you know, um, engaged and complicated as we are in the present. But it's funny, at least for me, um, echoing what Professor Jean Charles said, I, you know, I've taught courses around social movements and social justice in the past. And, you know, I remember teaching courses where students are like, especially in the Obama years, where they're like, but we're much better now than we were in 1970. And there's something that has happened and unfolded where it's become very visible to them that gains can be lost in an instant. Mm. That if we are not vigilant, things can unravel. Mm. And that, that reality now, especially I think in part because they really want to believe history, at least before, was teleological that we were all going to a better place, that we were better in 1990 than we were in 1955, right? That we were better in 2012 than we were in, you know, 1970. And so I think that this moment really has made them understand that I mean, these kind of uh, issues that are really intersectional, but also centrally, you know, um, rooted in the way we see ourselves as citizens in a country, in civil rights, that these issues and these rights can easily dissipate in a matter of a blink of an eye. And so I think now more than ever, they, even though, you know, these are books that I've taught or issues that I've taught about, it's never um, felt as just as clickable, as just as relevant for the kinds of things that my students are thinking about and the complicated world that they are confronting on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Loza. So we have a question here. Um, what would you say to your students that voted for the first time in 2016? 
and may have faced deep disappointment with the result. I always, you know, uh, with my students, I always quote Baldwin, right? So you think your pain and your heartache is unprecedented in the history of the world and then you read. And so I would tell my students, you know, let's think about, and I often tell my students, in fact, um, to think about what are, what are some examples in history um, of our ancestors having experienced similar disappointment, right? Or having experienced um, similar devastation. Uh, having experienced similar despair, right? Um, again, Toni Morrison also. I guess I would just probably, the, the short answer is I would quote a bunch of people. <laughs> um, you know, Toni Morrison, there's no room for self-pity. This is not time to despair. This is the time to go to work. This is when artists go to work, right? So what are you going to do? Uh, I, I am someone who uh, cries with my students often. It happened, I think it was the day after, you know, the week of the Breonna Taylor. Um, the, the, the jury announcement, um, you know, I cried with my students. I cried with my students um, four years ago um, after the election. I'm um, hoping not to cry again this year, but you know, we'll see. Being present for students in their pain is actually something that I really do believe that also embodies a black feminist ethic. Um, and that really, you know, is, is a form of engaged pedagogy, right? And I also tell them, I just said this to a student yesterday, like, I don't know what to tell, sometimes I don't know what to tell them, right? And I think that that's fine. And I think they learn from that when we see, um, as opposed to being transactional in their thinking and in, in, in their development, and even in their, you know, Boston College, we talk about formative education all the time, being transactional in formation, it's not like you come to me and I'm gonna have the answer and then now you're better, but it's actually through that process, right? It's the processual nature of that relationship between faculty and students that you're best able to learn. That's how I learned from my mentors. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about, you know, students being disappointed in 2016, I think the answer that I gave, right, after I, I was actually teaching a minority politics class in, in 2016, and the answer that I gave is that, you know, um, there's a balance of power and institutions, uh, you know, we, we can rely on branches to check each other. And, you know, right now, uh, I that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> so I, I think there's no good answer to that, right? But I, I think the the good, there's no good answer to what to do about being disappointed because mm -hmm. I think politics can be disappointing. Um, but I think thinking about every four years as being the touch point for your engagement is is not the right way to think about mm -hmm. political engagement at mm -hmm. all right um i think it's um you know being actively engaged at what's happening at the local level and even at the state level is meaningful right um because we can think about um how the the president affects our daily lives but um even more touching or even more uh, sometimes even more meaningful is what's happening at the state level that we often don't see, right? So the census year, um, this is a census year, right? And the Supreme Court just made a decision that uh, the census collection is going to stop, right? And so what does that mean for um, redistricting, which is going to happen in 2020? Our redistricting happens at the state level, right? They're happening in state legislatures. Um, and so thinking about the equation of not just presidential election years, but also what's happening across the landscape of politics is important. But, you know, more broadly, um, being disappointed about the, the election, the election cycle. I mean, I, I too am human and I have my moments of disappointment and I, I can't not be transparent about that, that there are things that happen that I'm also not happy with. And um, I think thinking about that answer that I gave in 2016, that institutions will save us, they won't and they don't. And that was me trying to uh, be an engaged professor, but also give an answer. But there's also not always an answer. I mean, for me, the disappointment is a call to action. If you're disappointed, then what are we going to do about it? That's right. 
So we can sit and there are several levels of disappointment. One, we take care of ourselves and our communities and make sure we are okay. And then there's another level, which is what else beyond that are we gonna do? And I think for my students, you know, I always say disappointment is that call to action. What can we change? And also let's not, I mean, for, 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 you know, how I teach or what I teach, I always say, let's not get it twisted. Things weren't rosy before, <laughs> you know, things weren't perfect. And, you know, people were getting detained and incarcerated and, you know, we had a deportation machine and regime. And so things weren't rosy. So let's not, you know, look back with these, you know, rose colored glasses and think, well, it, you know, years ago wasn't as bad. Maybe it wasn't as bad for one person, for, for me personally, but there was lots of communities that felt left out of like this project that is the nation, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we look at those, you know, on the margins and say, that's not okay. That is not okay. Um, I just, you know, especially when I think of communities that, again, are undocumented, are guest worker, I just kind of, you know, always, you know, say, you know, why is it that we are just okay with a food system that perpetually exploits them? And we say things like, but we can't have an apple cost $10. Well, agriculture is not straight capitalism. They get basically subsidies. And now we subsidize corn and we subsidize soy way more than we subsidize soup, fruits and vegetables. But let's ask bigger questions. Like, why are we okay with a system that doesn't serve everyone? Why? And why do we say, mm, well, you know, and I think that there's a system also of, you know, making this seem like, oh, but, you know, again, geographic proximity, people's poverty, they don't, they don't have to come, but we have a system that exploits that, right? And we're just, okay. And so I always tell them, I mean, we can't, we can't look back at these periods and think there's one period that was perfect and rosy, you know, there just wasn't. And so let's think about what activists were doing at that, those moments in those junctures, how they were speaking, how they were pushing back, what lessons can we take? And what were actual, you know, moments where we say, mm, that's not something we want to replicate. Thank you very much, Professor Losa. Um, so here's another question. Could you tell us more about what political participation um, might look like drawing from the past or your research in light of the many challenges the world is facing? And if I could add on to that, I was thinking as you were all talking so um, I think persuasively about how important your um, your pedagogy is in, in the classroom, but then also what has animated your research. You know, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking differently about what to, the next research project should be or how you should be doing it or the audience for whom it, it should be written? Or I shouldn't even say written because Mireya has just done a, a wonderful um, exhibit, curated an exhibit over at the Museum of Natural History um, and girlhood. Right, so there's lots of ways of, of telling hit stories and histories. Um, so I think um, th this question about participation is, is a good one because I think it starts from a point of thinking about what is political, right? I'm not a political philosopher, but right, uh, I think they are very much engaged in the, qu in the question of, you know, what do we count as being political? And I think that is an important question. How do you think about um, engaging the system more broadly? And I, I think that a lot of the things that we don't think are political can be, right? Um, uh, everything from like uh, Maria talked about, like buying practices, right? Um, it, it, uh, from, you know, the, we, we think about these uh, uh, very conventional things of, of voting, right? Um, but what about your engagement on social media? What about your, you know, in, engage or your, your reading practices? How are you spending your money? How are you thinking about yourself in relation to the state, right? It's not just these things, um, it's not just the conventional things, right? Um, certainly, um, 
voting is a thing, right? And I, I, I will not stop you from doing it and I will not discourage you from doing that, right? But um, it's not just those things, right? And if we think more broadly about what is political, it's not just this question of do you vote, but do you think consciously about how you engage with this system, um, engage in this nation state, think about your relation to your neighbors, to not just uh, your, your neighbor next to you um, in, in the place where you live, but our, our global neighbors, right? How are we treating our neighbors to the North and the South, right? Um, how we think about these narratives. So being in mid, I, I got my PhD from Michigan State, right? And so we were in very close proximity to uh, Canada, right? Um, I could walk to Canada if I wanted to, um, but we talk a whole lot differently about our neighbor to the South, right? Mm -hmm. And so how are we thinking about language and how we use language? Um, and I think that has a political connotation. I won't discourage you from the conventional things. I think you should do the conventional things, but I think we should expand our notion of what counts as political and not just think about ourselves in this space, right? In this American space, right? Um, and I say this as an American politics scholar, right? Not just thinking about yourself in, in this space, but how does um, you, your consumption have, um, and how this country consumes has impact on other spaces as well. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to take the second question um, about um, our projects. You know, how are we thinking differently about them? I will say um, I uh, was approached about writing a trade book and I honestly didn't want to do it. <laughs> um, I didn't want to do it because it was on a topic that I didn't feel was really my expertise, um, at least my, my academic expertise. Um, but it is a topic that is very close to my heart and, and is, is, is aligned with the other kinds of expertise in terms of how I live in the world. So um, it's a book about social justice and it's a book about, and so the way that I've divided it is to think about what are these cont three contemporary social justice issues. So Black Lives Matter, um, the movement to end violence against women and girls and um, prison abolition and really thinking about them through an intersectional lens. But um, I will say I've done the bulk of the writing this past year during the pandemic. And the thing that just keeps coming back to me is that um, this moment has actually, uh, made me feel so much stronger about the need for this book because um, I want to be able to, you know, give it to my neighbors, right? Give it to be able to give it to my literal neighbors in the town that I live in, you know, when they're asking questions about like, well, I don't get it. Like, why are people saying defund the police, you know, and to, to, to be able to have something um, that you could really just give to anyone. And a lot of it is really conversations that I've had with students over the years, conversations that I've had with other activists over the years, uh, conversations that I've had in my family or that I've had as a person of faith in different faith communities that I'm in over the years. And I'm realizing how much of a need there is for these kinds of um, books, you know, and I always thought, oh, yes, if I write a book about, you know, if I write a trade book, it's going to be something like, you know, Haitian, it'll be about Haitian literature, or it'll be about, you know, um, you know, black women in the anti rape movement. Um, so it's surprising to me, you know, but um, I do feel that it's helping me to think differently about uh, what I write, uh, what I write next as well. I mean, as for me, I, I feel like, you know, right now, um, I do my traditional research as a historian, single authored, you know, publications, but I also like to play in the space of public history and curating. And so, um, as you mentioned, I have an exhibition that I was part of the curatorial team that just opened up at the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian basically exploring the politics of girlhood in America. Mm -hmm. These are people who stand outside of electoral politics. So how do they make change? And how do they make change across American history? And I think, you know, it's one of these um, amazing moments where we can present a dynamic view of girls and, you know, not simplify and say, this is just girl power. No, and really say they put themselves sometimes on the front line and risk a lot. You know, they put their bodies on the front line to really call the nation to do better 
to be better. <laughs> and so um, that's one of the things that I think in the, in the sort of present moment, I feel much more like I'm doubling down on work in public history. You know, I love writing what I write. I like thinking about it, but I realize that there are, you know, people in, in you know, the communities I exist that won't not see an exhibition and will go and see these pro uh, products that spin off of public history. Um, so I think that's one of those areas that I'm really excited about right now. And more than anything, just again, just going back to those classroom spaces, you know, it's my first semester at Georgetown. And when I realized that you put Latinx in front of a course title like social movements, and you have a 80% Latinx classroom and these students that have been in this, these spaces that have never seen each other in an academic community, in conversation with books and ideas, and that that's important for them, that they need that. And so, you know, right now I'm developing a course because, you know, some students are undocumented and feel that they've never had a history here in the U.S. And what I'm sort of challenging them to see is that they are connected with undocumented people in the U.S. across time. And we can see how that emerges. And they have a history. Even if, you know, they're newcomers to the U.S., they have a history here. And so I'm really excited about, you know, those kind of, you know, pedagogical projects and projects with my students to really teach them that, you know, people may tell you that you don't belong here and that you don't have a history here, but people have paid a high price for your belonging. And I can tell you how that experience has emerged. Mm -hmm. Mireya, is it okay if I jump in? Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mireya, what you're saying resonates with me so much, um, especially that connection, you know, between the two points that you're making. So even thinking about the girlhood project, right. And then the museum and curating that, and then these students that might not necessarily see themselves as these kind of actors in the world. Right. Um, for me, I had a moment like that, thinking about Darnella Frazier, right, who was the 17 year old girl that recorded the video of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we wouldn't have had that video if it wasn't for Darnella Frazier, right? And she reminded me so much of many of my students um, that I have here at Boston College. And so just, you know, how do they see themselves as being able to, how do they see themselves, right? How do they see themselves in, in what's, what's unfolding around us? And then how do they also see themselves differently and get to, um, as people that can kind of impact this history? Yeah, and I, I think that just goes back to that original question of, of what is political? Like, how do you think about yourself engaging with the system? Um, because um, we don't, um, uh, women of color don't always have examples in, um, of, of role models in positions of power to look to, right? And when we think about traditional politics, but um, I think challenging what we think about as political and the actions that can be taken and how um, women, particularly women of color can be impactful is an important thing to think about. So we have only a few minutes. Part of the mission of this wonderful lecture series has been to think about what universities can be doing to advance racial justice. And you've all skirted around the fact that there haven't been spaces for students of color to gather, that you haven't necessarily had um, mentors that look like you. What radical transformation in Angela Davis's words to go back to the opening question, could universities take in this moment where we need some immediacy? Ooh, well, you know, I think funded action is important, right? So, and this is something Sawik and I like to talk about, you know, so how are they, um, you know, departmentalizing? So here at Boston College, our African and African Diaspora Studies program is a program. Um, I think departmentalization can, it can be a radical act in some contexts. I think that, um, also uh, endowed chairs are important. So this is me kind of thinking from the administrative perspective. Um, I think that, 
you know, acknowledging just yesterday, I, not yesterday, last week I was reading about, um, I was reading the Duke Haiti Reader and there was an account written by a Jesuit priest who was witnessing the killing of the enslaved people on the island of Saint-Domingue, which today is Haiti, right? And, um, you know, I, I, I think I took, I sent the passage this week and she said, we need to, you know, really think more carefully about how we talk about reparations and repair. Um, and I think that even, you know, there, there are archives that have not been discovered in terms of the, the even the culpability or, um, of how Jesuits have been, maybe were bystanders as well, right, in, in racial violence. Um, and so I think that that doing, uh, you know, something that would be radical would be even to like the, this self-examination of where has the harm been created um, for people, not just, not just for people to say, you know, to share our stories for us, Black people, to share our stories of the harm that's been done to us, but really saying, well, how has this university um, been complicit in the harm? I know Georgetown has done some of this work, but uh, what struck me about that example that I read was that it wasn't just about, you know, um, who were the Jesuits or who were the that owned the slaves, but it was also who were the bystanders, right, that stood by. And, you know, this, this, this applies to rape culture as well, right? Um, and so I think, so I would say funded action, I, I would say more archival work. I think um, creating those spaces for students is, is very important. Um, and I think really amplifying the voices of, of students. Um, and I, I, I want us to, again, always take that intersectional lens, right? So we really have to think about sexuality, gender, and class, right? We haven't even started to talk about class in relation to racial justice in the academy at the university, right? So who are our students? Where are our students coming from? Um, how are they being recruited? We have, again, we could talk about the athletes. I mean, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much, there's so many directions uh, for us to go in, but those are, those are a few. Well, Thank you, Professor John Charles, for, for um, giving the university uh, marching orders. Um, this has been really um, generative and fantastic, and I want to thank you all. Um, for those of you tuning in, um, the Gender Justice Initiative will be hosting Professor Scott and uh, Professor Nadia Brown, who will be joining us next year as the newly um, hired chair of the Women and Gender Studies program, along with a couple of other scholars to talk about Black women voters, activists, and politicians. If you're interested, um, go to the Gender Justice Initiative website and sign up. You'll get our, um, you'll get our announcements. Thank you all very much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.